Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Brian Bird, and I am the Southwest Program Director for Defenders of Wildlife. I'm here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where our regional office is. Today, we're very happy to present a, a very special talk about ocelot in Texas. This presentation is entitled Ocelot in a Spot, Conserving Wild Cats in Texas. And I'm very excited um, to welcome all of you. We have people from across Texas and beyond the state lines joining us today. This event today is part of the annual Ocelot Conservation Festival. The Ocelot Conservation Festival is now in its 25th year, believe it or not, a quarter of a century. And Defenders of Wildlife is thrilled to partner with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the Friends of Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge to celebrate ocelots in Texas. During the talk today, please drop your questions into the chat box. Um, Sherry Wilcox, who will be our presenter, will have time to answer those questions at the end of her talk, and I will moderate those questions. So again, welcome everybody. Um, Defenders of Wildlife is um, an organization that is dedicated to the protection of all native animals and plants in their natural communities. We were founded in 1947 and we're one of the premier US-based national conservation organizations dedicated to the protection and restoration of imperiled species and their habitats in North America. I'm really excited to run our Defenders of Wildlife Southwest Field Conservation Program, which includes Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico. Our headquarters office is here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We have approximately seven staff in our region, and we focus on a whole suite of exciting animals and plants in our region and conservation. Just to name a few, uh, the Mexican gray wolf, the jaguar, the cactus ferruginous pygmy owl, Mexican spotted owl, uh, the jumping mouse, New Mexico meadow jumping mouse. And in Texas, um, our, our premier species we work on is the ocelot, which you'll hear more about today. But we also have very robust campaigns on the golden cheek warbler, which nests nowhere else in the world except Texas. We have sea turtle campaigns. We work on aplomato falcon and horned lizard and all kinds of exciting wildlife in the state of Texas. Texas is blessed with incredible biodiversity because of all of the different biomes that come together from Mexico and North America and the Gulf of Mexico. So Texas, as always, has a superlative. It is one of the most biodiverse states in the country and Defenders of Wildlife takes our work there very seriously. So today we're gonna to have a really nice talk from Dr. Sharon Wilcox. Dr. Wilcox is a senior representative for Texas. She focuses on wildlife habitat connectivity and restoration, landowner outreach, ocelot conservation, and other threatened and imperiled species, including raptors, bats, reptiles, and amphibians. She also serves on Defenders Southwest Jaguar Conservation Team. Before joining Defenders, of Texas, in Texas, Sherry served as the Associate Director for the Center of Culture, History and Environment in the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has also worked for the Texas Office of Ocean Conservancy, and she has served as a lecturer in geography at the University of Texas, Austin, and the University of Texas, San Antonio. She started her career at Defenders of Wildlife in the early 2000s. Sherry has a PhD in geography from the University of Texas at Austin, She's the co-editor of the book, Historical Animal Geographies, and has authored a number of scholarly articles and books and chapters examining contemporary and historical interactions of humans and wild cats in the US-Mexico borderlands. She's currently finishing a book entitled Jaguars of Empire. And we're really excited to have her today to give us the full story on ocelots in Texas. So welcome Sherry and please start your presentation. All right, well, thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Brian, and welcome, everyone. I am so excited that you are joining us today to learn a bit more about ocelots in Texas. And um, I think I've got some interesting information to share with you. Let me get my slideshow going. 
Um, so today I'm, I'm going to do an overview of the challenges facing ocelot conservation in Texas and the work underway to address those challenges. I'll note that every image you see of an ocelot in this slide deck is an image from Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge in South Texas. And so the images might not always seem like the best. There'll be a lot of these night vision ones because these cats are nocturnal. At times the imager is, might appear a bit blurry as the cats are running past a camera trap. But again, these images are really special because they're giving us a view into the lives of these Texas cats. One other quick note I'll make about the images you're going to see. At times, you may see what appears to be a cage behind a cat. That is not a cage. These cats are fully wild at the refuge. Um, what you're seeing behind them is often hog fencing. We do um, have some challenges with feral hog populations at the refuge. And so places have been created for cats with bubblers or water fountains. Keep your eyes out for those in the images. Um, that gives the cats a steady supply of uh, clean, non-saline water throughout the year. Um, and the hogs would dig those up. So we surround them by about three foot tall hog fencing. So again, not a cage, hog fencing, and the cats either jump over or they can actually squeeze right through the squares in the fence. And on that note, I'll tell you the question I hear the most often in my work. What is an ocelot? I even have ocelot license plates. I'll talk about those more lately, later. And people will stop me in parking lots and say, wait, what, what is an ocelot? Often people guess this, which is really sort of funny. This is an oxalotl. It is a lizard. Um, its name also comes from the, the Nahuatl language. And so I think people sort of conflate the names because they come from a, a common cultural origin. But this is not an ocelot. <laughs> When people do know ocelots, um, they tend to know about them from popular culture rather than from the Texas landscape. I often will hear people reference Archer, the cartoon. Um, there is an ocelot in this cartoon TV show for adults. His name is Babu. Remember that name. I will mention that name again later. Um, so this is a, a, a reference point in popular culture, but even more commonly, children know ocelots. Um, ocelots wander this virtual landscape of Minecraft. So this is an online game, a uh, video game that um, is sort of a safe place for children to sort of learn about playing in these gaming environments. And so you can, I, I believe, have pet ocelots on this, in this, within this game. So children know about them and they know them from this TV show, Wild Kratz. And I'd like to say this particular episode, Spots in the Desert, is actually highlighting ocelots in Arizona, which I will also talk about in just a moment. Um, and our ocelot biologist, Dr. Hilary Swartz at Laguna Atascosa, um, worked with the, the creators of this episode and helped them to make sure that the representations of ocelots in this cartoon were accurate. So um, I encourage you to check it out, particularly if you have children. So back to that fundamental question, what is an ocelot? You probably all know an ocelot is a cat. They are a medium-sized wild cat. They range in size from about 15 to 30 pounds. The males are larger, generally speaking, than the females. It makes the ocelot really unique is this chain rosette pattern, spotting pattern. Um, wildlife author Ernest Thompson Seton in 1929 wrote, he described um, this ocelot coat as the most wonderful tangle of stripes, bars, chains, spots, dots, and smudges, which look as though they were put on as the animal ran by. And I think that is just the most wonderful description of an ocelot pelt that I have ever read. What is also really nice about the spotting patterns on this cat is that each one is unique. It's like a fingerprint. And this makes monitoring ocelot populations a bit easier because over time, both through ca camera trap as well as live um, capture and release, we come to know these cats from their spot record. And we maintain careful databases behind the scenes so that we know cats when we see them and we can identify new cats when they appear on the landscape. 
Now I mentioned we do have a few ocelots in Arizona. So these cats um, are found only in the Western Hemisphere. They range from Argentina northward to Texas and Arizona. In Arizona, we do have photographic evidence of these cats as recently as January of last year, 2021. And that's the image you're looking at on the right-hand side of your screen. However, we don't have evidence of any female ocelots on the landscape in Arizona at this time. And without female ocelots, we by definition don't have a population. And so at this time, those male ocelots that we do have records are, of are identified as lone male dispersers or males who are pushing the edges of their range in search of new, new territory. If a female were to uh, pop up on camera trap in Arizona, there would be a serious conversation about revisiting the idea of a population. But again, at this time, we do not have that in Arizona. And overall, we think there may just be a few of these males in that area in the southernmost portion of that state. Now in Texas, we absolutely have a breeding population. We have robust records of males, females, and kittens. There's believed to be uh, approximately 60 to 80 cats in Texas, and this is the northernmost breeding population. In Cameron County, these cats live on, at Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge, so they're living on federal land. Additionally, these cats occupy private ranch land in Willisee County. Now at this time, I'll talk about this more in a bit, these two populations, the federal and the private lands cats cannot reach each other. Additionally, there's a third subpopulation south of the border in Tamaulipas, Mexico, about 100 miles south of Texas. And that population, along with the two Texas populations together, genetically are all one population, but they've been fragmented into these subpopulations. So this gives you a, a sense of the historic range and where the cat wandered in Texas. I'll come back to that as well. Um, but just here for a moment to give you a sense of where these cats are in Texas and that northernmost breeding population in eastern Mexico. Now a bit more about the lives of ocelots on the Texas landscape. Ocelots are dietary generalists. All cats are obligate carnivores, which is just a really fancy way of saying cats only eat meat. But within that, ocelots are generalists. They're not tied to one prey species. Rather, they are ambush predators who are quite opportunistic and will capture lizards, avian species, birds, um, bunnies, rodents, which are a particular favorite for ocelots. And so really the only thing governing what an ocelot eats is size, because again, these are fairly small cats, 15 to 30 pounds. So they are not taking down cattle or anything large like that. These are not what we consider conflict species who are causing trouble for ranchers. Rather, they are mousers. As not picky as ocelots are about what they eat, they are extraordinarily picky about where they live. So in Texas, ocelots are habitat specialists who exclusively reside in a matrix of plants called Tamalipan thorn scrub. Now Tamalipan thorn scrub, again, isn't one plant, but rather a mix of plants that are dense, low lying to the ground, and spiny. Everything in this mix seems to have a thorn on it. Um, so these spiny shrubs and small trees dominate and it's interspersed with um, sharp edged grasses, forbs and succulents. In years where I'm able to do field work, I often have to buy new clothing at the end of the field season because my clothing just gets torn apart, crawling on hands and knees through this dense spiny forest. Now ocelots being smaller cats, love this habitat. It provides excellent cover for them for denning so they can raise their young. Um, it's also excellent protection for these cats. They are vulnerable to coyotes and other um, larger animals. And finally, it provides excellent cover again for hunting. These are ambush predators and they love hunting in this forest, this thicket of spiny 
material, planty material. So they prefer and exclusively reside in thorn scrub in Texas. Now in other parts of their range, they reside in very different forest landscapes, but here is where we find them north of the US-Mexico border. And this is giving you another view. I, it's really hard to take pictures of thorn scrub. Um, the longer you stare at this image and your eye adjusts to the gradations in green, you start to see how rich the biodiversity is within Tamalip and thorn scrub and what excellent cover this, land, this, this matrix of plants really provide for these cats. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you're going to see a lot of black and white photos of these cats. Um, it's because they're nocturnal. They are active at night and they're almost crepuscular, which means they really like er the evening and the early morning hours. So right around dusk, right after dusk, and then right before dawn are real prime ocelot hours. Another note on ocelot lives is that they have a very slow, or a, I shouldn't say very slow, they have a slow rep reproductive rate. They have one or two kittens every one and a half to two years. So their litter is one or two kittens in size, but then those kittens stay with their mothers for quite a while. Their mothers protect them from other male ocelots, and they don't leave their mothers until they've really almost reached physical maturity at two years old. There's a lot we don't know about ocelot fertility, ocelot pregnancies, uh, because ocelots are very cryptic cats. They prefer to live their lives quietly in the tamalip and thorn scrub. And so it's very difficult to observe them and their, their ways of life. Um, we are learning a lot from research on uh, cats that live in zoos. Uh, and we're slowly learning more based on remote camera imagery, which of course just gets better and better. And it gives us this wonderful glimpse into these, the lives of these cats without harming them or disrupting them in any way. So in the United States, the ocelot is critically endangered. As I mentioned, there are 60 to 80 cats left in the state and there are 17 known individuals at Laguna Atascosa. So on the federal refuge lands, we know of 17 cats who've been recorded in the past two years. Uh, there could certainly be more cats who just haven't been caught on camera, new babies, things of that nature. We may have also lost ocelots um, to old age or other events, but at this time, the number is, uh, we believe, 17. This is good news. Um, when I started working a few years ago on this project, our number was at 12. So our population is trending in the, in the right direction for recovery. People often ask me, how did this happen? How, why has the number of ocelots decreased in Texas so much? There are a couple of reasons. So historically, these cats did range throughout the state. Uh, this is a terrific map done by a man named Scott Dubois that documents historic occurrences of jaguars and ocelots. So these yellow cat heads are, uh, I'd say, substantiated sightings. Often they are paired with actual photographic evidence. A lot of these sightings are recorded from newspaper accounts. And again, a lot of them included photographs of ocelots. So we have this wonderful record of cats as far back as the early 19th century through into the early 20th century throughout the state. Here are, here are two examples of these um, sighting data, essentially, that we have been able to glean from local newspapers. Here on the left, you'll see a cat that um, was killed in Waco in 1959. So Waco is north of Austin, about halfway between Austin and Dallas. Um, on the right hand side of your screen, maybe an even more surprising sighting, um, an Amarillo Daily News had an image of an ocelot that was killed on a road in 1950. So again, up through the middles of the 20th century, these cats persisted in low population numbers throughout the state. Now, the reasons for their decline, there are a few. In the 20th century, pet trade was a significant pressure on these cats throughout their range. 
I found this image in a National Geographic and it really stood out to me. So National Geographic is a trusted voice, right? That brings nature, brings wildlife into the homes of people throughout the world. And here we have National Geographic in 1963, referring to the ocelot, the Texas ocelot, as an overgrown tabby in fancy dress and a debonair man about the forest. This article noted that the Long Island Ocelot Club held a number of social events and was really celebrating ocelot pet ownership. So this was popular even in the United States, even in areas where ocelots were not found on the landscape. This was further normalized um, by magazines like Life Magazine, who did this photo series on this ocelot living with this woman. And you may know this cat. I told you to remember the name Babu. This is the original Babu. This is Salvador Dali, the artist, and his very famous cat, Babu. They traveled together all over the place. Um, he would take this cat out to dinner in New York City. He took him on an ocean liner with him across the Atlantic. This cat was photographed all of the time with Dali. And again, this is reinforcing the notion that these are big pets. This was certainly impacted cats in the lower Rio Grande as well. This is a local news story of a Mexican leopard, which is another name for an ocelot, um, who was struck but not killed on a road right outside of what is now Laguna Atascosa. And in 1942, this man you know, accidentally hit this cat. It was not killed. So he, and this is the most Texas thing you're gonna hear all day. He quote, then lassoed the leopard and carried him to Los Fresnos where it was on display. So this cat was not killed, but was removed from the wild and put on display. Outside of the pet trade, the fur trade had an immense impact on ocelots throughout their range. It takes many ocelot pelts to make a full coat. And in the early to mid 20th century, fur coats were all the rage in fashion. And so there was a lot of demand for this very soft, beautifully marked pelt. Now today, the pressures from, from the pet industry and from the fur industry have decreased significantly. And instead it is unintentional impacts on ocelots that really continue to uh, affect their, their survival on the landscape. In the lower Rio Grande Valley, these cats first were losing land to agricultural development. This is of course a very fertile region and it is a very important region to agriculture for the United States. And so a lot of that thorn scrub was turned over, tilled to the earth. And in, in its place, we have these crops that are planted. And this, these are not landscapes that ocelots can survive in. And frankly, they're even really hesitant to cross open fields. So the, this transition to agriculture pushed these cats into smaller pockets of land. At the same time in the valley, we see industrial development, including liquid natural gas export facilities in the Brownsville Ship Channel. That's what you see pictured here. Um, I'm going to come back to this issue later when I talk about uh, some of the work we're doing today in the valley. But again, this, this particular image that you're seeing right now is right in the what we call the Ocelot Conservation Corridor. It is directly south of Laguna Atascosa. So this is significant and it is only growing this industrial development. And finally, the story more now than ever is urban, urbanized and suburbanized sprawl. If you've been to the Valley, if you've been out of Brownsville or Harlingen, sort of that low, the, the lower Rio Grande Valley on that southernmost tip, the transformation on this landscape, even in the last three or four years is, is stunning. Um, a lot of people are moving to this area. There's a lot more economic opportunity. And along with that is coming a lot of development. We're seeing a significant increase in home building, strip malls and roads. And that sprawl is turning over what remaining ocelot habitat and it's again, leading to the development of more roads on this landscape, which is of concern to us. 
Now this map right here is giving you a bit of a sense of human pressure on the landscape in Texas. This data is already at over a decade old. We are awaiting the latest data so we can update this map, but those red areas are indicating areas of high human pressure. Again, development, roads, agriculture. And you can already see there, the lower Rio Grande Valley is quite red. And I would say that that red has only expanded in the intervening 10 years. And I already mentioned roads. Um, this is a significant concern for ocelot conservation because mm -hmm. the leading known cause of death for ocelots in Texas is vehicular collisions. Um, and I say known cause, so um, unfortunately we often do see evidence of, of these deaths occurring as such as the inset image you see here when we find ocelots dead on the side of the road. Um, these are nocturnal cats, they're small, they're moving quickly across the landscape, and unfortunately that does bring them onto roads at night when drivers are less likely to see them and more likely to unfortunately hit them. 2015 to 2016 was a terrible year for ocelots. We lost seven ocelots on roads around Laguna Atascosa at that time. Um, I will say in 2021, we did have one, maybe two ocelots who were killed on roads. So this does remain a problem. I'm gonna talk about some of the interventions that have been done that are helping to drop some of these numbers, but we need to continue to address the impacts of roads and vehicles on roads and, and the challenge it presents for conserving and sustaining this population. Okay, so what are we doing? What, what are we doing to help protect and conserve these cats? There's a lot of challenges in front of them. Defenders works uh, both at the federal and the state level advocating for and defending laws and policies that protect endangered species like the ocelot. We also work to ensure that ocelots remain protected under those laws and that those re laws remain vibrant that they remain capable of protecting the species they are intended to protect, the species and the landscapes, I should say, that they are intended to protect. In, South Te or in Texas in general and in South Texas, we work with a number of partners to protect corridors of, of habitat for these animals and many other endangered species. The Fish and Wildlife Service has been a leader in this area. Um, they have invested over $90 million acquiring lands to create wildlife corridors that both run along and across the US-Mexico border, running east to west here, and also north to south in deep south Texas. And so this is a complicated map to look at, but what I'll call your attention to here is the solid green lands these are all right along the coast. This is Padre Island offshore. The Greenlands are Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge. Now the hash mark around Laguna Atas Atascosa and the dark red through here, these are priority lands for protection and conservation because we can't have random acts of conservation. We can't protect one parcel of land and another and not have them connected. We need corridors that enable animals to move freely in ways where they are not harmed on roads, but where they're able to move in search of mates, in search of prey, and in search of new territory. Male ocelots do not like to overlap ranges. And so if the population is going to sustain and grow, these male ocelots in particular need somewhere to go. And so we focus on this core area around Laguna Atascosa, but we're also collaboratively thinking about reconnecting the private lands, private lands ocelots to the public lands ocelots. So up here in the brighter red, this is our ranch land corridor. And right through here in the yellow, these are ideal pockets of habitat that could be reconnected in order to create corridors by which the federal lands cats and the private lands cats could potentially reconnect, which would be really important for the genetic viability of this population. 
Now, oh, I should back up just here for a moment. I'm, I'm going to shift your gaze now down to the southernmost portion of what we call the coastal corridor, this area of protected and um, candidate lands. And we're going to talk about some of the challenges and work being done in the southernmost area. All right, so now we've zoomed in uh, to give you a sense of scale. This is only about 10 miles across. This is Brownsville. This is the port of Brownsville. I showed you the ship channel earlier in the image on um, habitat loss for ocelots and challenges. Laguna Atascosa, as I mentioned, is right above the ship channel. And the lower Rio Grande Valley National Wildlife Refuge is just south. Now we have two challenges on this landscape. First, we have the development along the ship channel particularly liquid natural gas export facilities. At one point, there were three of these LNG plants. Uh, now there are two that were proposed to be built along the ship channel. Um, the one that was gonna be down here to the south of the ship channel has been canceled, but we keep careful eyes here on Texas and Rio Grande LNG. These are not built. They have not broken ground yet. They are still in their permitting processes. Um, but we are very concerned because this is some of the remaining ocelot habitat that could potentially connect Laguna Atascosa to Lower Rio Grande Valley. And once that's dug up, we've really lost that opportunity to connect that corridor. I'll also mention that ocelots are excellent swimmers. They're observed swimming in other parts of their range. And the Brownsville Ship Channel is not um, an impossible obstacle for the cats as long as they have habitat on both sides. Second, I will call your attention to the site right out here, Boca Chica. You may have heard of Boca Chica in the news. Um, this is the site of SpaceX's research and launch facilities in Texas. We are closely monitoring this site as well, and I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Briefly, I just wanted to mention that we did do an in-depth report a few years ago on the impacts, the potential impacts of these LNG facilities on ocelot recovery. If you would like to see this report, I would be more than happy to share it with you. I can uh, send it to you over email. So please just send me uh, an email. I'll share that at the end of this presentation. But this offers a, a landscape level analysis of exactly what the impacts would be on this endangered cat if those facilities were permitted. So returning to SpaceX, this is an image I took in August. The site is actually a lot more built out now. Um, this um, image to me captures our concerns about this site all in a nutshell. So if I'm going to back up here, you'll note that the SpaceX site is itself located on private land, but all around it is federal and state lands. So we have state park land, state beaches, and federal wildlife refuge lands. These include incredibly vulnerable wetlands and a number of endangered species call this landscape home. In fact, there are 10 federally listed species found in this area, including um, gosh, two endangered birds, that's the red knot and the piping plover, and five species of sea turtle. This is also in the ocelot corridor and is considered within the Jagarundi recovery area. That's another small cat. I'll also mention that this site is in a continental avian flyway. So this is a bird, uh, a, what should I say, a, um, hemispheric uh, flyway. We have birds coming in and out from across the world, across the hemisphere, who utilize this site as a stopover site or a nesting site. So this is a critically important site that at some times of year sees up to a million individual migratory birds a day. And in this image, you can see we have this wildlife crossing that was long ago designated as a site where animals might be crossing the road because on both sides we have park and refuge land. And right against it now, we have this development that will bring with it unprecedented vibration, unprecedented noise associated with the launching of rockets 
that have strengths that we have never seen before. The power of these rockets have never been witnessed before in human history. So we have a lot of concerns about what's happening at this site. And I will say that we are in the middle of uh, the FAA. It just completed a comment period in November on the environmental assessment of the site. And we are closely monitoring the FAA's findings. We're anticipating them in about a month. And if the FAA were to say that they had landed on what we call a finding of no significant impact, meaning the activities here, including launching, would not in, have significant impact on landscapes or species, we um, are exploring options to challenge that because we believe that a full environmental impact statement an EIS needs to be done at this site. And that is a very thorough environmental analysis of this site that would take in um, into account many more factors than what were taken into account for the EA or environmental assessment period. So um, keep your eyes open and we will uh, keep folks uh, in the loop as we await these results from the EA. Now we continue work on many other fronts as well. As I mentioned, roads are of primary concern due to ocelot mortality rates. Um, Defenders works at both the federal and state level advocating for funding for wildlife crossings and corridors as a part of our infrastructure planning. Um, at the federal level, we worked really hard uh, to um, have 353, I think it's 350, it might be $380 million included in the infrastructure bill explicitly for wildlife crossings and corridors. And now my job here in Texas is working with our lawmakers and um, all the way from local level to, to our state congressmen to look at how these funds can be implemented in this state. And of course, I am a voice for the ocelots as well as many other species in need of safe passage across our roads. And of course, this isn't just an, an issue for the safety of animals. This is also about safety for people and their property as well. We all win when we install wildlife crossings in ways where they are utilized by species. And so here, this is a webinar I did with Congressman Lloyd Doggett, as well as former mayor of San Antonio, Phil Harderberger, where we really talked about how incredibly, what an incredible opportunity these crossings are for Texans and for Texas wildlife. give you a peek on what an ocelot crossing actually looks like. They're a lot smaller than you think. Um, again, ocelots are small cats. These were very specially designed um, with ocelot preferences in mind and even modified at some points. It turns out ocelots don't like to get their paws wet. So little sidewalks were added to some of these crossings so that they can walk against the side. Um, signage and fencing have also been added to roads around Laguna Atascosa by Texas Department of Transportation. TxDOT has been a real leader in wildlife, cons or in wildlife crossings. They installed 12 underpasses around Laguna Atascosa, largely as a result of that, that terrible year from 2015 to 16, where we lost so many cats. This has come at a, at a cost of $8 million. So these are not cheap. A lot of design, a lot of thought, a lot of um, careful landscaping goes into creating these crossings. This is why the federal money included in the infrastructure bill is so important to the future of building more crossings like this. Um, so <laughs> these crossings were built, and I will say, uh, for the first year, ocelots were not using them. Uh, we have cameras on all of them. The cameras are being monitored closely alligators, lots of other native species throughout South Texas quickly adapted to using them. We saw people in there on hands and knees uh, to checking them out, no cats. Now, if you own cats, you know, if you buy them an expensive toy, they won't play with it, right? They go and play in the box instead. So the biologists kept telling everyone, don't worry, give it time. And sure enough, a year later, in 2020, we started seeing evidence of the cats using the crossings. And so this is Ocelot Male 331. 
The image on the left-hand side of your screen is from January 2020. This is him leaving the refuge, utilizing a crossing, so having safe passage out of the refuge. In March 2020, he was captured as part of the monitoring program back on the refuge. And so he's not in any way harmed in the photo on the right-hand side of your screen. He is, um, he's knocked out for the moment so that they could uh, assess his health and put a, ra a short-term radio collar on or GPS collar on him. Um, so this is a wonderful story of a cat gaining safe passage where otherwise he would be up on the road surface darting across again under cover of night at great risk. In addition to wildlife crossings, we are also supporting habitat restoration throughout those corridors that have been identified running north-south in what we often call the ocelot conservation corridor. It benefits so many other species besides just ocelots. When you think back to that image I showed you earlier of a fully mature Tamalipan thorn scrub landscape, and then you look at these plantings, you can see we have a long way to go. Habitat restoration is not an easy game, it's a long game. And there are challenges here. Um, acquiring this planty material is challenging. It doesn't have um, commercial value. So not many folks grow it for sale. I think Fish and Wildlife might be the only customer buying thorn scrub plants. Um, and again, rebuilding these landscapes, terraforming these landscapes, getting them back to mature, matrix matrices of plants is, is going to take decades, if not hundreds of years, but we have to start somewhere and we have to start now. And so Fish and Wildlife is um, leading in restoration of lands in the refuge and immediately around the refuge. And a number of conservation partners, including defenders, are looking forward to getting back on the landscape in the coming year and supporting larger scale uh, replanting efforts to get these plans underway to restore these environments. We also um, have long-term plans for some translocation. Uh, this again is led by Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, Defenders is an enthusiastic supporter. Um, there's a lot of discussion on what translocation will look like because we want this to be a safe translocation for candidate cats. The long-term goal would be to potentially introduce a cat or two from Mexico into the Texas population. Reconnecting those cats is not going to be anything that happens in the short term so that they could naturally recolonize. And so human intervention would be needed to get that, that flow of genetic material between the two subpopulations. In the shorter term, what we're now thinking is more of a translocation between the federal lands and the private lands. But again, there's a lot that needs to go into this because we would want the cat to be able to settle in, find territory, and establish its range where it's reintroduced. And the welfare of that cat is of, of significant concern because again, we have a finite number of ocelots on the ground. More recent work is now being done to extract genetic material from male ocelots, wild male ocelots. And there is exciting research now being done that might make translocation look more like um, in vitro fertilization. So translocation might not end up being cats, adult cats, but rather it might be genetic material. Um, the benefit there in impregnating females from that genetic material would be that the cats are not at risk in the same way. They would um, be, you know, give birth to these new cats essentially, and they would be born onto landscapes that would feel like their home territory. Um, because there is a lot of concern about taking cats and moving them on the landscape, including them trying to get back from where they came. So keep your eyes open um, on the news. We will always share things on our social media because there's a lot of exciting research being done in this area. Finally, an area that we are very interested in here at Defenders is the sociocultural dimensions. So the people, the human communities that live in the Rio Grande Valley alongside these ocelots. We're very interested in a, promoting awareness of these cats. Um, so raising awareness for their presence on the landscape, 
promoting what we call coexistence techniques. I'll share a few of those in a moment. And also really fostering pride. This is a really cool animal. And this is the only place that this population lives in the US. And so in raising awareness, I, that pride goes right along with it. Um, some school groups have changed their mascot to the ocelot. So there's been a lot of really warm reception for these cats in local communities. And the main challenge is just awareness that they're even there. Uh, social media is an excellent tool for us to learn more about where different groups of people are at and how they understand the challenges ahead of ocelots. Um, so this image went viral about a year ago. And I, I loved it because I got to read all the comments in social media. And it's so interesting because it helps me to understand how who to reach out to and how to talk about some of these issues. Um, these comments were very interesting. People were saying things like, huh, I fancy myself an amateur animal encyclopedia. I didn't know these could be found in the US. Or panthers, yes. Bobcats, yes. First time I've heard of ocelots wild in the US. Didn't know they didn't even know about them being here. So these are really interesting data points for us. Social media also helps us to understand other coexistence techniques. So I mentioned that ocelots eat rodents. They really like rodents. And a growing issue of concern for us is raising awareness about not using rodenticide in communities right around the refuge and ranch lands where these cats live. Because when that poison is introduced to control rodents, it enters the food web of that local area. And what we see is biomagnification. So as ocelots prey on rodents, they acquire more and more of this poison in their own system and it slowly poisons ocelot or potentially could slowly poison an ocelot to death. Now we don't have a lot of data about this because ocelots are cryptic species and a sick ocelot is going to be even more likely to stay in the thorn scrub and, and we're never going to see the evidence of rodenticide, unfortunately. Um, so we, our challenge here is to raise awareness in local communities and invite them to consider other more ecologically friendly manners of rodent control. And again, some of these comments are really interesting. So, and I, my apologies here, if um, this person is on this call, I meant to black out her name and it slid, um, but this is a wonderful comment. So we posted this, or Viva the Ocelot, one of our partners posted this message about poison, poisoning rodents and impacts in the surrounding environment. And the comments were very much of this nature. Like, I was shocked reading this. I had no idea. I didn't even think about this. And so again, this is a wonderful opportunity to engage with local communities and talk to them about changes that can be made that can have a substantial um, impact on the surrounding or the nearby ocelot population. Now I want to leave you on a happy note here, which is first telling you what ocelots are doing to help their population and then telling you what you can do. So ocelots are doing a good job right now. They are having babies. So we had a mini baby boom in 2016, including this little guy um, who is very small. He was probably just a couple of weeks old. And then in 2020, we documented another baby boom at Laguna Atascosa, including this cat who was one to two months old, who was recorded on Thanksgiving Day 2020 on camera. And so this really brings hope for the future of this population. These cats are still reproducing and essentially replacing themselves in the population. Now, the most important question might be what you can do to help these ocelots. First of all, uh, there is the Ocelot Conservation Festival, which occurs every year in Brownsville and Harlingen, Texas. Um, I invite you to check out Viva the Ocelot. That's a Facebook group. I have the link at the end of this talk. They do have some events planned in Brownsville this year. Um, with COVID, everything is still slightly different. I believe it is an all outdoor, low density masked event to keep everyone very safe. Um, I will also mention there is not an ocelot ambassador at that event this year. 
zoo cats are quite vulnerable to COVID themselves. And you may have read in the news that I think a couple of snow leopards, unfortunately, were killed by COVID. So in the interest of keeping the cats safe as well, there is not a, a visiting ocelot coming to the event this year. But in future years, this is once again a very robust event with um, talks from biologists, talks from other experts, lots of activities for the family, a fun run, all sorts of fun stuff. And that is in the Valley every March. Throughout the year, you can get involved by following us on social media. You can follow our national accounts. I think we're on every social media platform. On Facebook, Texas has its own page, Defenders of Wildlife Texas. And our partners at Viva the Ocelot, that's the Friends of Laguna Atascosa, they also have a very vibrant page that talks a lot about ocelots and ocelot conservation. Now, when you uh, see this, this content, I encourage you to share it and help us to raise awareness with broader publics across the state and across the world. If you're able and when you're comfortable, I invite you to come visit Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge. You will not see a wild ocelot. You might see a bobcat though, they're not as cryptic. Um, the cats stay hidden, but it's really neat, very special to hike through this thorn forest and know these cats could be all around you. And this is also a world-class birding destination. Also invite you as things improve in the coming year to join volunteer events as they come available. Um, we're hoping to sponsor some habitat planting days again in the coming months. And I mentioned these coexistent techniques, coexistence techniques. If you happen to live in the valley, um, doing simple things like slowing down and watching out carefully on roads, utilizing poison free rodent control, um, encouraging hunters to use lead free ammunition and adopting leave no trace ethics when you're recreating can all help us to protect ocelots and many other wildlife species. If you're feeling motivated to and comfortable, you can also become a voice for wildlife. You can become an advocate. You can speak up for the for, you can speak up in continued support for endangered species protections at the national and state level. You can support efforts to protect species and habitat on private, state, and federal lands. You can advocate for wildlife crossings in Texas. This is a huge one. And you can raise your voice in opposition to development that would destroy native habitat and potentially um, affect ocelots and again, other endangered species on the landscape. And finally, if you're interested, there is the Safe Texas Ocelots license plate. I'll warn you, it's a bit of a conversation starter. People ask me about it, but it is a terrific way to support ocelot conservation at Laguna Atascosa. And it has a beautiful image of an ocelot as you can see here on the license plate. And with that, um, I thank you all for joining us and we will transition into Q&A now. And um, together we can ensure this cat does not fade from the Texas landscape. And um, very briefly, you can find me at defenders.org. Thank you very, very much, Sherry. That was fascinating and thorough. Uh, I learned a lot and I am consider myself somewhat knowledgeable of Ocelot. Um, I wanna invite everyone who's on with us today. If you have questions, please type them into the chat um, function there and we can then see what your questions are and Sherry will be able to answer them. So again, please, if you have questions, put them in the chat. Clearly, I, I was so thorough in my expected <laughs> <laughs> explanations. <laughs> and don't worry, if you're thinking of a question, somebody else is thinking it too. There is no such thing as a simple question. They're all important. I couldn't read that entire question if it was. I think I see it. Um, okay. The question is, is Laguna uh, with, the Texas, with the Texas Zoo with their ocelot production? 
you know, I don't quite know, Bernadette, what you, um, what you might be referring to. Um, let's see here. I, I do know that they have partnered with the Texas Zoo in the past because to, the Texas Zoo did have um, ambassador ocelots at one point, but I'm not sure what their current status is in partnership. So we have another question. Can ocelot defend themselves against bobcats? Oh, that's a really good question. And one we are still exploring in the sciences. So throughout the range of uh, bobcats and ocelots um, do commingle, or not commingle, but they overlap in habitat. Um, bobcats are taller, but they're actually similarly sized cats. We don't have a lot of documented conflict between them. There is some concern that bobcats could interfere with ocelot recovery. We're not witnessing it at this time on, um, on Texas landscapes, but um, it's cert certainly something that we scientists are working to study and understand more. So a couple more questions. Yes, our recording will be available to you and I we should be able to email that to this list. Um, and then the next question with our last bit of time with the proposed Fish and Wildlife Service law of hunting affect safety and life of ocelots. So I think that's referring to the changes that uh, were made to uh, encourage hunting in refuges. You know, I am actually not familiar with how those changes in the law would be enacted at Laguna uh, at Escosa. So unfortunately, I can't speak to that. But mm -hmm. I would say that we support a full biological assessment of any lands within the refuge to really understand what species are present before hunting would be opened up, um, bow or other yes. types of hunting. So we have a question about critical habitat and development. And yes, people can develop their private property, but there are ways to enter into habitat conservation agreements with Fish and Wildlife Service that would allow for ocelot habitat to be on that property um, with development as well. So there are ways to do that. Um, and then finally, last question, uh, do they sound like domestic cats? Are there similar noises? No, they they have um unfortunately the one or two times I've been around um ocelots, they were a little stressed out because they were waking up from being knocked out as part of the monitoring program. And the sounds they were making were not very domestic cat like. <laughs> um a little lower pitched, I would say. Um and they're they don't meow. These are not roaring cats, though. They are purring cats. You either roar or purr if you're a cat. And these are purring cats. All right, well, that uh, concludes our presentation, Ocelot in a Spot, Conserving Wild Cats in Texas. Thank you, Dr. Sherry Wilcox. And I wanna say this is part of the 25th Annual Ocelot Conservation Festival in sponsorship with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Lag Friends of Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Service, or Friends of Laguna uh, National Wildlife Refuge. Thank you all very much for being with us today and I uh, do look for the recording. Thank you. Thank you.